Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari. Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Hari Hari, Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. It's time to hear about Krishna. It's time to hear about Krishna. This is the, a summary study of the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam by Stephanie Kreis, A.C. Bhaktivedanta, Swami Prabhupada. The founder Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And the father of the Sankirtan movement as we, worldwide Sankirtan, as we now know it, Hare Krishna. Krishna. Deliverance of the demon Bhamashura. Pastimes of the Lord are so wonderful. So What's happened so far, because we're almost done with the chapter, is Bhamashura was actually the son of the earth personified, but he was a demon, and he went around the universe kidnapping ladies from the royal order, the daughters of kings. And he had 16,108 of them locked up. And Krishna killed Bhamasura. So then the deity of the earth, the earth personified Bhumi, she's offering prayers to Krishna. And she has a grandson, Bhagadat, whom she's asking the Lord to give shelter to. When Lord Krishna heard the prayers of Mother Earth, he immediately assured her of immunity from all fearful situations. He said to Bhagadat, her grandson, don't be afraid. Then he entered the palace of Bhamashura, which was equipped with all kinds of opulences. In the palace of Bhamashura, Lord Krishna saw 16,000 108 princesses. That's a big palace. Who had been kidnapped and held captive there. When the princesses 
saw the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna enter the palace, they immediately became captivated by the beauty of the Lord and prayed for his causeless mercy. Within their minds, they decided to accept Lord Krishna as their husband without any hesitation. Each one of them began to pray to providence that Krishna might become her husband. Who is this providence they were praying to? Oh, let's see. Let me understand providence. Praying to providence to have Krishna as their husband. Who's providence? Let me see here. Open up. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Hare Hare. Providence. Definition of providence. What is the definition of providence? Divine guidance or care. Divine guidance or care. Okay. Divine care. So they pray, they begin to pray to providence that Krishna might become their husband. Sincerely and seriously, they offered their hearts to the lotus feet of Krishna with an unalloyed devotional attitude. As the super soul in everyone's heart, Krishna could understand their uncontaminated desire, and he agreed to accept them as his wives. Thus, he arranged for suitable dresses and ornaments for them, and each of them, seated on a pelican, was dispatched to Dwarka City. Krishna also collected unlimited wealth from the palace, along with chariots, horses, jewels, and treasure. He took from the palace 50 white elephants, each with four tusks, and all of them were dispatched to Dwarka. After this incident, Lord Krishna and Satyabhama entered Amaravati, the capital city of the heavenly planet. And they immediately entered the palace of King Indra and his wife, Sachi Devi, who welcomed them, Krishna presented Indra with the earrings of a deity. Mamashura had stolen them and Krishna was returning them. When Krishna and Sachibama were returning from the capital city of Indra, Sachibama remembered Krishna's promise to give her the plant of the Parajata flower. Taking the opportunity of having come to the heavenly kingdom, she plucked a parajata plant and kept it on the back of Garuda. Once Narada took a parajata flower and presented it to Krishna's senior wife, Sri Rukmini Devi, on account of this, Satyabhama developed an inferiority complex. She also wanted a flower from Krishna. Krishna could understand the competitive womanly nature of his co-wives, and he smiled. He immediately asked Satyabhama, Why are you asking for only one flower? I would like to give you a whole tree of Parajata flowers. Ah, actually, Krishna had promised, had purposely taken his wife Satyabhama with him so she could collect the Parajata with her own hand. I was wondering why. Krishna went to uh, kill Bhamashura. Why did he take his wife with him? Now the answer is here. Because, Krishna knows everything, they would be going to see Indra to return earrings to 
into his wife, Sachi Devi, that Bhomashura had stolen. And at that time, Sachibama would be able to take one of the Parajata trees. Actually, Krishna had purposely taken his wife Sachibama with him so she could collect the Parajata with her own hand. But the denizens of the heavenly planet, including Indra, became very irritated. Without their permission, Sachibama had plucked a Parajata plant, which is not to be found on the earth planet. Indra, along with other demigods, offered opposition to Krishna and Sachabama for taking away the plant. But in order to please his favorite wife, Sachabama, Krishna became determined and adamant, and so there was a fight between the demigods and Krishna. As usual, Krishna came out victorious, and he triumphantly brought the Parajata plant chosen by his wife to the earth planet, to Dwarka. After this, the plant was installed in the palace garden of Sachabama. On account of this extraordinary tree, the garden house of Sachabama became extraordinarily beautiful. As the Parajata plant came down to the earthly planet, the fragrance of the flower also came down, and the celestial swans who migrated to this earth in search of its fragrance and honey. King Indra's behavior toward Krishna was not very much appreciated by great sages like Sukadev Goswami. Out of his causeless mercy, Krishna had gone to the heavenly kingdom, Amaravati. So that's evidently Indra's planet, Amaravati. Amaravati, 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 to present King Indra with his mother's earrings. Okay, it wasn't, it wasn't his wife, it was his mother, Aditi. King Indra's wife is Sachi, but the earrings were stolen from Indra's mother, the mother of the demigods, Aditi, okay, which had been lost to Bhamashura. Indra had been very glad to receive them. But when a flower plant from the heavenly kingdom was taken by Krishna, Indra offered to fight with him. This was self-interest on the part of Indra. He offered his prayers to bring down his head to the lotus feet of Krishna. But as soon as his purpose was served, he became a different creature. That is the way of the dealings of materialistic men. Materialistic men are always interested in their own profit. For this purpose, they can offer any kind of respect to anyone. But when their personal interest is over, they're no longer friends. This selfish nature is not only found among the richer class of men on this planet, but is present even in personalities like Indra and other demigods. Too much wealth makes a man selfish. A selfish man is not prepared to take to Krishna consciousness and is condemned by great devotees like Sukadev Goswami. In other words, possession of too many worldly riches is a disqualification for advancement in Krishna consciousness. Unless, of course, they're using what they have in the service of Krishna. After defeating Indra, Krishna arranged to marry the 16,100 girls brought from the custody of Bhomashura. By expanding himself in 16,100 forms, he simultaneously married them all in different palaces in one auspicious moment. He thus established the truth that Krishna and no one else is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. There is nothing impossible, for Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is all-powerful, omnipresent, and imperishable, and as such there is nothing wonderful in his pastime. 
all the palaces of the more than 16,000 queens of Krishna were full with suitable gardens, furniture, and other paraphernalia of which there is no parallel in this world. So this is taking place in Dwarka, and 5,000 years ago, Dwarka was manifest here on this earth planet, and there were 16,000 palaces, well, 16,108 palaces, Krishna. I wonder how many houses are in a small city. I wonder if I can find that information. I think Krishna. Google knows everything. We'll ask Google. Hey, Google. How many households in, say, Gainesville? Oh, 52,000 as of 2019. So there's 52,000 households in Gainesville. And this is only 16,108 palaces. Hey, piece of cake. It's actually possible. How do you like that? Yeah. We should, okay. There is no exaggeration in this story from Srimad Bhagavatam. The queens of Krishna were all expansions of the goddess of fortune, Lakshmiji who is an expansion of Srimati Radharani. The queens of Krishna were all expansions. The queens of... <laughs> Krishna used to live with them in different palaces, and he treated them in exactly the same way as an ordinary man treats his wife. We should always remember that the Supreme Personality of Godhead was playing exactly like a human being, although he showed his extraordinary opulences by simultaneously marrying more than 16,000 wives in more than 16,000 palaces. He behaved with them just like an ordinary man, and he strictly followed the relationship between husband and wife required in ordinary homes. Therefore, it is very difficult to understand the characteristics of the Supreme Brahman, the Personality of Godhead. Even demigods like Brahma and others are unable to probe into the transcendental pastimes of the Lord. The wives of Krishna were so fortunate that they got the Supreme Personality of Godhead as their husband, although their husband's personality was unknown even to the demigods like in their dealings as husband and wife, Krishna and his queens would smile, talk, joke, embrace, and so on, and their conjugal relationship ever increasingly developed. In this way, both Krishna and the queens enjoyed transcendental happiness in their household life. Although each and every queen had thousands of maidservants engaged for her service, the queens were all personally attentive to serving Krishna. Each one of them used to receive Krishna personally when he entered the palace. They engaged in getting him seated on a nice couch, presenting him with all kinds of worshipful paraphernalia, washing his feet with the Ganges water, offering him betel nuts, and massaging his legs. In this way, they were giving him relief from the fatigue of being away from home. They saw to fanning him nicely, offering him fragrant essential floral oil, decorating him with flower garlands, 
dressing his hair, asking him to lie down to take rest, bathing him personally, and feeding him nice, palatable dishes. All these things were done by each queen herself. They did not wait for the maidservants. In other words, Krishna and his different queens displayed on this earth an ideal household life. Thus in the Bhaktivedanta purport of the 58th chapter of Krishna, the deliverance of the demon Bhamasura. Oh, Krishna. Ah, it's one of those sleepless nights. The next chapter is talks between Krishna and Rukmini. This is where Krishna is playing a, a joke on her, a trick. Because he wants to see her get angry. But instead of getting angry, she passes out. <laughs> she gets overwhelmed. She gets overwhelmed by what he's saying and passes out. So it talks between Krishna and Rukmini. Once upon a time, Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the bestower of all knowledge to all living entities from Brahma to the insignificant ant, was sitting in the bedroom of Rukmini, who was engaged in the service of the Lord, along with her assistant maidservants. Krishna was sitting on the bedstead of Rukmini, and the maidservants were engaged in fanning him with chamara, yak, tail, fly whisks. Lord Krishna's dealings with Rukmini as a perfect husband is a perfect manifestation of the supreme perfection of the Personality of Godhead. There are many philosophers who propound a concept of the Absolute Truth in which God cannot do this or that. They deny the incarnation of God or the supreme Absolute Truth in human form. But actually the fact is different. God cannot be subjected to our imperfect sensual activities. It's funny. Just a few sentences before, Prabhupada more or less chastises the philosophers who propound that God cannot do this or that. in relationship to appearing as a human. And now, like one sentence later, Prabhupada says, God cannot be subjected to our imperfect sensual activities. So first he says, God cannot do this or that. And he poo-poo's philosophers who say that God cannot do this or that. And then the very next sentence he says, God cannot be subjected to our imperfect sensual activities. Hi, <laughs> Krishna. He is the all-powerful, omnipresent personality of Godhead, and by his supreme will, he cannot only create, maintain, and annihilate the whole cosmic manifestation, but he can also descend as an ordinary human being, in order to execute the highest mission. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, whenever there are discrepancies in the charge of human occupational duties, he descends. He is not forced to appear by any external agency, but descends by his own internal potency in order to reestablish the standard functions of human activities as well as to simultaneously annihilate the disturbing elements in the progressive march of human civilization. In accordance with this principle of the transcendental pastimes of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he descended in his eternal form of Sri Krishna in the dynasty of the Yadus.
The palace of Rukmini was wonderfully finished. There were many canopies hanging on the ceiling with laces bedecked with pearl garlands, and the whole palace was illuminated by the effulgence of valuable jewels. There were many flower garlands of Bailu and Chamala, Chamali, which are considered to be the most fragrant flowers in India. There were many clusters of these plants with blooming flowers enhancing the beauty of the palace. And because of the exquisite fragrance of the flowers, little groups of humming bees were gathered about the trees. And at night, the pleasing moonshine glittered through the network of holes in the windows. There were many heavily flowered trees of Parajata, and the mild wind stirred the flavor of the flowers all around. Within the walls of the palace, I wonder where she got all those Parajata trees. Within the walls of the palace, there was incense burning, and the fragrant smoke was leaking out of the window shutters. Within the room, there were mattresses covered with white bed sheets resembling the foam of milk. The bedding was as soft and white as milk foam. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, Krishna lies down on the uh, milk ocean. <laughs> As Chiradakshai Vishnu, he lies in the, in the milk ocean. So the bedding was soft and white as milk foam. In this situation, Lord Krishna was very comfortably sitting and enjoying the service of Rukmini, assisted by her maidservants. Rukmini was also very eager to get the opportunity of serving the Supreme Personality of Godhead as her husband. She therefore wanted to serve the Lord personally and took the handle of the chamara from the hand of the maidservant and began to move the fan. The handle of the chamara was made of gold, decorated and bedecked with valuable jewels, and it became more beautiful when it was taken by the by Rukmini, because all of her fingers were beautifully set with jeweled rings. Her legs were decorated with ankle bells and jewels, which rang very softly between the pleats of her sari. Rukmini's <coughs> raised breasts were smeared with kunkum and saffron, and thus her beauty was enhanced by the reflection of the reddish color emanating from her covered breasts. The highly raised lower part of her buttocks was decorated with a jeweled lace girdle and a locket of great effulgence hung on her neck. Above all, because she was engaged in the service of Lord Krishna, although at that time she was old enough to have grown up sons, her beautiful body was beyond compare in the three worlds. When we take account of her beautiful face, it appears that the curling hair on her head, the beautiful earrings on her ears, her smiling mouth, and her necklace of gold all combined to shower rains of nectar, and it was definitely proved that Rukmini was none other than the original goddess of fortune who was always engaged in the service of the lotus feet of Narayan. The pastimes of Krishna and Rukmini and Dwarka are accepted by great authorities as manifestations of those of Narayan and Lakshmi, which are of an exalted opulence. The pastimes of Radha and Krishna in Vrindavan are simple and rural, distinguished from the polished urban characteristics of those of Dwarka. The characteristics of Rukmini were unusually bright and Krishna was very much satisfied with her behavior. Krishna had experienced that when Rukmini was offered a parajata flower by Narada Muni, Satyabhama had become envious of her co-wife and immediately demanded a similar flower from Krishna. In fact, she could not be pacified until she was promised the whole tree. That was actually done by Krishna. The tree was brought down to the earth planet 
from the heavenly kingdom. After this episode, Krishna expected that because such a Bama had been rewarded by a full tree of Parajata, Rukmini would also demand something. Rukmini did not mention anything of the incident, however, for she was grave and simply satisfied in her service. Krishna wanted to see her a bit irritated, and therefore he schemed in order to see the beautiful face of Rukmini in an irritated condition. Although Krishna had more than 16,108 wives, he used to behave with each of them with familial affection. He would create a particular situation between himself and his wife in which the wife would criticize him in the irritation of love, and Krishna would enjoy this. In this case, because Krishna could not find any fault with Rukmini, for she was very great and always engaged in his service, he smilingly, in great love, began to speak to her. Rukmini was the daughter of King Bhishmaka, a powerful king. Thus, Krishna did not address her as Rukmini. He addressed her this time as the princess. My dear princess, it is very surprising. Many great personalities in the royal order wanted to marry you. Although not all of them were kings, all possessed the opulence and riches of the kingly order. They were well behaved, learned, famous among kings, beautiful in their bodily features and personal qualifications, liberal, very powerful in strength, and advanced in every respect. They were not unfit in any way, and over and above that, your father and your brother had no objection to such marriages. On the contrary, they gave their word of honor that you would be married with Sishupa. The marriage was sanctioned by your parents. Sishupa was a great king and was so lusty and mad after your beauty that if he had married you, I think he would have always remained with you just like your faithful servant. Hello, oh, Krishna. Okay. We'll stop there and we're going to hear how Krishna torments Rukmini with his trying to get her to be irritated with him. Okay. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare.